Male gliding leaf frogs leap from the treetops. To slow their descent, they use their huge webbed feet as parachutes. These large tree frogs spend most of their lives in the high canopy and only come down when it's time to breed. Once settled, they begin to serenade their unseen females. Now it's time for the females to make their move. There's no shortage of suitors, but this female has already made her choice. She's heading towards the loudest call, because loud calls come from big frogs, and big is best. But to reach him, she must run the gauntlet of a gang of smaller suitors. Their only chance of mating is to make a sneaky interception. He scored. But with more females arriving all the time, it's not over until the fat frog stops singing. Feet, so vital for gliding, are now put to other uses. Two's company, three's inconvenient. But in any case, all male frogs are equipped with dry thumbs, which enable them to get a vice-like grip on their moist partners. It's a case of first come, first served. Living in such a humid environment means jungle frogs are less tied to puddles and pools, and these even lay their eggs out of water. There's little chance of them drying out, and up here they're safer from predators. The big storm is the cue for the most important climb of this frog's life. It's a male in search of a mate. But if he is to find one, he has to get to the top. He needs to keep his wits about him, for the rain also brings out hunters. Easy does it. the top at last. But he's late to the party. The higher a male sits, the further his voice will carry. So the top slots are worth fighting for.
And he's won. He has the top place. So now it's time to sing. And a white-bellied female responds. They join together to mate. The loser will have to wait for the next storm before he sings again. She lays her eggs on a blade of a long leaf and he, using his back legs, folds it over and glues its two edges together shutting the eggs inside. This sealed nest is the safest place these leaf-folding frogs can find to protect their precious brood. At the first floral beacons of spring, triggering a rampage of wildflowers, an increasingly rare sight in the rest of agricultural Europe. Mediterranean catchfly forms pink saucers around the cork oak trunks. The evergreen, umbrella-like canopy provides welcome shade for these light-sensitive flowers. Unlike so much of Europe, there's hardly any chemical runoff from the surrounding land, so spring rains replenish the streams and ponds with beautifully clean water, which is good news for the pollution-sensitive animals like amphibians. These are male marsh frogs trying to attract females and establish a territory. In the slower moving rivers and pools throughout Alentejo, striped neck terrapins are abundant. Like all reptiles, terrapins are cold blooded a need to absorb heat by basking on suitable rocks. Throughout early spring, barn swallows use the mud they collect from the margins of the pond to construct and repair their nests. Marsh frogs are not the only noisy amphibian here. Stripeless tree frogs are also common. They reserve their mating chorus until nightfall. During the night, a male Iberian midwife toad has kept a chain of eggs moist in the pool. Wrapped around his hind legs, they shackle the toad for six weeks until hatching. Before dawn, he'll find a damp, cool shelter to prevent the eggs from drying out. Fire salamanders hunt for invertebrate prey throughout the night. With its striking yellow and red markings, this is a rare subspecies found only here. It will also hide up during the day, as too will the spadefoot toad. Using its shovel-like rear feet and corkscrew body movement, the toad buries itself in the soft soil of the cork forest before the end of the night. During all the time I was in Japan, there was one place that caught my imagination more than anywhere else. It's a small island called Yakushima, probably the most biologically diverse place in this entire country, certainly the most exciting destination for a naturalist. But I never quite got the chance to come here. Until now.
Yakushima is an island that's pretty much defined by rainfall. This is the soggiest place in all of Japan. In fact, the locals have a saying that on Yakushima, it rains 35 days a month. That being the case, though, the landscape's endlessly rich and green and alive, rent through with streams of crystal clarity, and it hasn't rained today yet. This divine mossy forest is a botanist's dream. It's almost like a film set, really, with all the trees draped in epiphytes and vines. Every piece of dead wood or tree root is covered with at least four or five different species of moss peppered through with fruiting bodies. You sort of expect to find some mystical creature hiding behind each one. The architecture of this forest changes as you climb higher along the mountain trails, with giant Yakushima cedars like mighty pillars dominating the canopy. The ancient cedars found on this island are some of the most fascinating trees in the world. And they look as if they've been sculpted by some truly tormented mind. This one here is less than a thousand years old. They can get to be at least twice that age. The woods of such high quality, so full of resin, but even a couple of hundred years after the tree dies, the stump can actually prove a seeding ground for a fresh tree. Locals call trees like this kosugi, which means youngster. Even so, this one was around before the time of the samurai, but now it's much more than just a tree. There's epiphytes, other small trees, and mosses all growing off the main trunk. It's a whole living community. And that's just the plants. If it was warmer, it would be crawling with life. But for now, the subtropical heat seems to have deserted us. Oh, I've got a frog. It's a little rain frog look. Yakushima's absolutely perfect habitat for frogs. It's damp, it's green, there's lots of food. And I'd actually expect it to be seeing an awful lot more than we have done, but it's a lot cooler than we were expecting. This rain frog will have spent the coldest part of the year, the winter, hibernating under this rock. But now it's springtime, pretty soon they'll be thinking about coming out and looking for a mate. It's the Raja Brooks Birdwing. It's got the most impressive wingspan. These are incredibly rare here. The simple fact that they're so beautiful that collectors will pay immense prices for them. Apparently, if you can get a live specimen to Japan, they can be worth about as much as a thousand US dollars each. They're far better out here on the wing. The steep canyon sides are home to some very specialized creatures. This frog has evolved to live on the slippery waterfall rocks and is an expert at avoiding capture. <laughs> Professor Tyrone Hayes has been chasing frogs since he was a child. If you go down the bottom, I'll try to come to the top. He's gonna go straight into the waterfall, I bet. <laughs> what it does is it leaps into the waterfall to escape predators or scientists that want to collect it, and that's exactly what he did. Rather than jump back, he went straight over the boulder. Hammerhead flatworm. Bizarre. With time running out, Gordon is using technology to help the search for species. It's a video camera trap that captures animals 24 hours a day, if it's put in the right spot. It's running. Knowledge of the animals is much more important than your actual knowledge of the equipment because you've got a manual that you can open up and if you've got half a brain in your head, you can work out what a piece of equipment does. Um, but with animals, you've got to, or with making wildlife films, you've got to have an understanding of the animals. Good luck. The camera trap is on a natural hilltop trail he believes animals regularly use. With two days to go, 
a mysterious sound has been heard, far away down the valley. The haunting call of the orangutan. Now, with forest destruction, truly wild orangutans are very rare and notoriously shy of humans. These orangs were filmed in a well-established nature reserve where they're used to the presence of humans. To find a population in Imbac would be a major breakthrough. This call is the first evidence that orangs live in the canyon. Justine is off in pursuit. She follows the river all the way down to the edge of the canyon. We didn't think there were orangs around here at all. We haven't found any around our camp. Um, no signs, no nests, nothing. So uh, this is a bit further afield. We've followed the inback down and, um, you know, there's definitely orang around here. So that's great. Maybe there's more than one. Who knows? But she's probably on some sort of circuit and she'll come back if, she's, if this has got fruit on it. The remains of the orang's favourite food, figs, lie all around. Quite a perfume smell. Very soft. Justine decides to use the highest tree in the area as a lookout post. But I can hear them. They're proving elusive so far. Fingers crossed today will be the day. Or they'd just be stingless bees to annoy me, and that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. 